football referees are supposed to be unbiased, right? Like, like they're not supposed to be influenced by fans or coaches on the sideline, right? I'm just not much of a sports guy. I'm just checking. Like, that's okay. Well, it, it turns out, according to a 2016 study that was reported on NPR, that isn't actually always the case. Michael Lopez, a researcher at Skidmore College in New York, led a study that showed, it proved statistically, that when a flag is thrown on a football play, near the sideline, referees are more likely, statistically speaking, to call the play in favor of the team whose sideline they're next to. Michael Lopez analyzed over 1,400 penalty calls given over several years. And, and he showed, and where they specifically noticed it was on the, like, the late hit, the out-of-bounds tackle. You know, and what he, what he said is, bodies are moving fast, they're moving hard, and sometimes if the guy's out-of-bounds, if you don't know, it, it's illegal to hit a guy once he steps out-of-bounds. But they're, they're in midair. They can't, like, stop, you know. And he, what he noticed is when they're on the sidelines near, you know, let's say, like, today, right, with the Chiefs and the Eagles, go Chiefs. Um, I grew up in Missouri. That's, that's, uh, that, that was pre-decided for me before I was ever born. Anyway, um, you know, if, if the Chiefs have the ball and they're trying to get down the field and they, you know, they're over on the Eagles' sideline, the referee might be tempted to compromise a little bit and call it in favor of the Eagles. This has been statistically proven by science. And some of you big football fans out there are going, that's not right. I agree. It's, it's not. It shouldn't be that way. But it is. They compromise on that judgment. Now, at a football game, that's not good, especially if it's your team that is the one that gets hurt by the call. And on this Super Bowl Sunday, I want to talk about a different kind of compromise, one with many more far-reaching and long-lasting consequences. Open your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 12. First Kings chapter 12, starting verse 25 is where we're going to be today. Thanks for being here. For those watching online, thanks for logging in. Really, it takes a little extra work to really do church online. So fill out your online connection card. Uh, be active in the chat. That helps you stay engaged with us and vice versa. Uh, for those here in the room, again, just a reminder, I want to thank Jamie uh, for her word earlier to fill out your connection card and that we're not having 2020 tonight. Uh, because that's kind of been bumped to tomorrow night. Uh, and I'm super excited about what TCM and discipleship.org and renew.org are doing to bring God's people together for prayer and fasting and Jesus style disciple making. This is, it's, as I've had meetings about this over the last few months, y'all, it's not just us. God is moving his whole church this way. And it's awesome to see. And tonight, uh, or excuse me, tomorrow night, uh, y'all can be part of it. I'm not going to be there. Something happened this week that, that bumped that on my schedule. So um, we are grandparents now. Uh, so we had, yeah. <laughs> There's little Wesley three weeks early. A uh, little, little trouble breathing, so we appreciate your prayers that way. Um, but Wesley, Micaiah, Thomas, Micaiah is a variant form of Michael, okay? Uh, so, and it's, it's Garrett's uh, middle name and his grandfather's name and the other grandfather's name was Michael. So it's, those are the names there to honor. And mom and baby are doing great. Um, it's, it's kind of an, an, a crazy, <laughs> Emma and Garrett were trying to get moved before the baby came. Surprise! Um, so they're, they're literally, they had a baby and they're in the middle of a move this week. So I'm, I'm headed down, it's a full day today. Deb went down yesterday with the kids. Uh, I'll, I'll head down first thing tomorrow. So we're, we're excited about that. But uh, as much as I, I'll, I'll hate to miss that prayer meeting, but y'all come. Um, I'll, I'll, we're going to do it a month later too. So we're going to continue to do that. We're continuing, or concluding rather, our series called You Are Here Today. And over the last six weeks, we've been looking at these places in Israel, the, these events that happened long ago and far away, places that, that a lot of you may never get to see in person. But those places, those events actually affect how we live our lives today. 
And we've been talking about over the last few weeks how that is true. Our You Are Here place today is Tell Dan, T-E-L. Now, just as a reminder, uh, the word tell means hill or mound, but it's an artificial hill. It, it's, it's, it's built up. It's layers of habitation and destruction. I've mentioned to you before that archaeology, one way to define it is that archaeology is the study of durable trash. It's the stuff that, that people just threw out and they didn't know, they didn't mean to keep, but it, it got kept and, and it just kind of builds up and builds this mound over time. And this place today is called Tel Dan. It's in the far north of Israel, uh, near the border with Syria and Jordan. In fact, there's a place that you can stand, I'll show you a picture later, and you can see Syria and you can see Jordan. Two, uh, two other countries, which for Americans is weird. Europeans are used to that. Their countries are smaller, they're packed together. There are places where you can stand and see two different countries. For us, I don't know that there's anywhere in America where you can see two other countries at the same time. Uh, but here you can, uh, and I'll show you a picture later. Uh, let me orient you to where we are on the map. So there's Dan, so it's well north of the Sea of Galilee, almost due east of the city of Tyre, okay? Uh, and you can see uh, down below there, you know, the, the, this is, so this is Old Testament. Now, oh, kind of the middle, lower middle left on the map, there's Megiddo. We talked about that a few weeks ago, right? So there's Dan. It's way up north, and then you've got on the kind of, yeah, there it is. Um, you've got Syria, and that's ancient Syria. It's Jordan today, but the country of Syria is actually the yellow uh, on the map uh, up there today, okay? Um, and then let me give you kind of an aerial orientation of where we're going to be. Here's the aerial shot uh, from this, okay? So there's, here's this place, this Tel Dan is this whole site, uh, and it's actually a national park. So like, you know, here's the brochure, right, uh, for, for the park. Um, you've got the high place of Jeroboam, that's what we're going to talk about, that's the place. You've got the headwaters of the Jordan River, so this is where the Jordan, like, starts. You've got this middle bronze gate over on the right, we'll talk about that later. And then this, this, this is the Iron Two, that's Iron Age, Iron Two Gate and Fortifications. That's, that's the ancient city of Dan. So it's this ancient Israelite city. So this is where we're going to be. And we're, we're ending the series kind of where we began it because this place is really just a little further uh, east, or further west rather, from Caesarea Philippi where Peter confessed Jesus as Messiah. And this wasn't originally the, pl the plan <laughs> When, when I laid out the series, I wasn't going to talk about this place. I'd never been there before. Because when we went in 2016, the, the tensions between Israel and Syria were so bad, they were like, you can't really go further north from Nazareth. Please don't. Or, or you know, the area right around Galilee. Any further north is a bad idea for, for Americans. <laughs> so we didn't get to go. And, and I wasn't planning on talking about this. We were going we to end the series uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane today. That's where we're supposed to be. And I got to this place, and I shot a video because I was kind of blown away. And I was really conflicted about this. Uh, this, this place affected me so profoundly. I wasn't planning on, on doing this. This wasn't even laid out in the series. We were going to go to the Garden of Gethsemane. And I was telling Deb about this. I'm like, I shot this extra video because it really moved me. And I wasn't even planning on it. But I, I kind of feel obligated to do what I set out to do. And she said, honey, just... Talk, just show the video from the Garden of Gethsemane on our Good Friday service. <laughs> Brilliant. I knew there's a reason I married you. You're smart. So, um, <laughs> so if you're not, uh, not quite ready to leave Israel in our You Are Here series yet, you get kind of one more bonus one on our Good Friday service. Uh, I'll show that video from the Garden of Gethsemane, so you'll want to be here for that. Um, and that really leads me to, to something else. It's a bit of an aside, but I think it's important. When you travel to Israel, when you have this experience, you, you kind of cycle between different reactions to these places. Some places that you go, you expect to be amazed, and you are, right? You, you expect it like, this is going to be awesome, and it is. You go to, for me, Capernaum was that way. It, it, was, it was like, whoa, this, I mean, it just, if, and we talked about that, the place of teaching, right? The, the synagogue at Capernaum, and you expect to kind of be blown away, and you, and you just, you sit there. Of course, we were there on a Sunday afternoon, right? So I'm sitting by the, the, the Sea of Galilee on a Sunday afternoon, listening to the water lap, and we're in the town of Jesus, and it was just like, this is awesome. And then there are other places that you go, and you expect to be amazing, and they're not, 
or at least it does weird stuff in your heart. Like, I expected to be blown away when I went to the shepherd's field outside Bethlehem, but this is what you see when you go there. <laughs> it says, Gloria in excelsis Deo, which is the Latin of what the angels said to the shepherds, but it's like, you know, the shepherd's field brought to you by Universal Studios. It's just weird. It's, and it's in the middle of a neighborhood. You know, you expect this to be rural and pastoral, and there's a cave there, and you go in the cave, and it's probably where the shepherds were sheltering, and, and you know, maybe the sheep were in there, and there's a little star and laid on a mosaic, and it's really pretty, but it's just weird. Like, you, you think, this is going to be awesome, and it, like, I feel like I'm at Disney World. It's just strange. But then there are some places. There are some places where you don't have any expectations. You don't know what to expect. And you're just kind of floored when you get there. And tell Dan was like that for me. This is a place of compromise. Watch. Hey, Temple Rock. We are here at Tell Dan. This is the ancient uh, high place where King Jeroboam of the northern kingdom of Israel set up a second altar. You can see the metal structure here over my shoulder. That's where Jeroboam set up this altar and it became an alternate place of worship. Over here behind me, up there, where you can see the folks standing, right there is the high place where he built a golden calf. Yes, for real, a golden calf. And instructed the people of Israel to go and worship there um, instead of going all the way to Jerusalem. This was convenient. This was... Um, a way for him to, to exercise control over the northern kingdom as it split away from the southern kingdom. You remember under Solomon, uh, you know, his son Rehoboam was, was advised to make things easier on the people and instead he made it harder and it broke the kingdom in half. This was the place where Jeroboam set up that altar and it became a place of compromise. The people thought, well, this is easier, eh, it's closer, it's nice and green here, it's not as multi-mile trek down to Jerusalem. Let's just worship here. And this was the place where Israel apostasy, this was the beginning of a religious disaster for Israel. The author of First Kings, and we don't know exactly who that was, is documenting the beginning of, and we find out later the beginning of the end of, the northern kingdom of Israel. Well, the author intends, now whether or not the author intends for this to be a cautionary tale or not is something that the scholars debate, but what's not open for debate is that the result of Jeroboam's actions led to a spiritual disaster for the people of Israel. Let me give you a little historical background so that you understand the text when we read the text, and then we'll read it. This comes right after the united nation of Israel splits into two kingdoms. So you have the, the, the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. Solomon's son and heir, Rehoboam, listened to bad advice. I mentioned that in the video. He made a huge mistake. And this caused the nation to be split with Jeroboam becoming the first king of the northern kingdom. Now, I know what you're wondering. Who in the world is Jeroboam? I've never heard of that dude, all right? Well, we don't talk about him a lot. Um, but it's, it's important that you know who this guy is. Jeroboam was one of Solomon's officials during the reign of King Solomon. He, he's a natural leader, all right? And in 1 Kings eleven twenty eight, 28, he is described as, quote, a man of standing. That's the exact same phrase that's used to describe Boaz in the book of Ruth. Natural leader, good guy, pillar in his community. Everybody looked up to Jeroboam. And because of that, Solomon, in his reign, put him in charge of the whole labor force. He was from the tribe of Ephraim. And Solomon put him in charge of the whole labor force of Ephraim and Manasseh, the, the tribe next door. And when he sees how hard Solomon is driving these people to do all these building projects, he rebels. He leads a rebellion. It doesn't go well. <laughs> And he has to run to Egypt for a while. He comes back. And then Rehoboam, Solomon's heir, makes this huge mistake. And God appoints Jeroboam to be the king of the northern kingdom. See, this is a crucial narrative point because it tells us how Jeroboam was so easily able 
to pull ten tribes over to his side, which is something that God ordains in 1 Kings 11, the chapter prior to our text. But I think it also illustrates just how far Jeroboam fell in his relationship with God. Because for the sake of getting what he wanted, political control, he gave up what he needed, a relationship with God. Do you ever know anybody who makes that compromise? That to get something that they want, they give up something that they need? <laughs> Let's read how that all came down. Look with me at 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 25. Then Jeroboam fortified Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim and lived there. From there he went up and built up Peniel, which built up, it means a wall around the city, fortifications, he's turning it into a fortress. Jeroboam then thought to himself, the kingdom will now likely revert to the house of David. So by that he means, you know, you've got Saul and then his house ends, you've got David and Solomon and Rehoboam, that's the house of David, right, the southern kingdom. If these people go up to offer sacrifices at the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem, they will again give their allegiance to their Lord, Rehoboam, king of Judah. They will kill me and return to King Rehoboam. After seeking advice, the king made two golden calves. He said to the people, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. One he set up in Bethel and the other in Dan. And this thing became a sin. The people came to worship the one at Bethel and went as far as Dan to worship the other. Jeroboam built shrines on the high places and appointed priests from all sorts of people, even though they were not Levites. He instituted a festival on the 15th day of the 8th month, like the festival held in Judah, and offered sacrifices on the altar. This he did in Bethel, sacrificing to the, to the calves he had made. And at Bethel he also inst installed priests at the high places he had made. On the 15th day of the 8th month, a month of his own choosing, he offered sacrifices on the altar he had built at Bethel. And so he instituted the festival for the Israelites and went up to the altar to make offerings. Now, it might be tempting to think that there's no application for us in this text. We need to resist that temptation. Because I think there's a powerful lesson for us here, and it's today's big idea. Here's the big idea this morning, that we can avoid spiritual disaster by embracing the inconvenient, costly, and just plain hard aspects of following Jesus. Jesus never, ever, ever promised that following him would be simple and easy and no big deal. And anyone who tells you otherwise is probably trying to sell you something. If you want to avoid spiritual disaster in your life, you need to embrace the inconvenient, costly, and just plain hard aspects of following Jesus. And Jeroboam's life is, is a cautionary tale about that. For King Jeroboam leading the northern kingdom, but continuing to faithfully worship God the way the Lord commanded in the law of Moses would have been inconvenient, it would have been costly, it would have been just plain hard. And because he doesn't want to pay that price, he compromises and ends up leading his entire nation into a spiritual disaster. So what was it? How did that happen? Those are good questions. I'm glad you asked. <laughs> I think the most helpful way to deal with this text is to do kind of a, a post-mortem on Jeroboam's decision to do these things. The decision he made turned out to be, in very short order, an unmitigated spiritual disaster, which ultimately led to other forms of disaster for the people of Israel. So it raises two questions. What led to this, and how do we avoid it? When we think about like someone's life just going completely off the rails, I think it's worth asking, what led to that place, and man, how do I avoid making the same mistake? I, those, those are good questions. So let's just kind of use that as our structure today to, to figure out what Jeroboam did wrong. Let's ask the question, what leads to disaster? In the text, there is a three-stage progression that leads to Israel's apostasy. That's a fancy theological word, and basically it just means that Israel rejected their covenant with God. They walked away from it. And we still use that today. When someone who has been a Christian for a long time, who's followed Jesus, deconstructs and doesn't come back. And it's called apostasy. It's a real thing. <laughs> so what led to that? Well, there's this three-stage progression we can see in the text. Here's, the first, here's stage one. Bad advice leads to compromise. 
Bad advice leads to compromise. There are a couple of places where we see this. In verse 26, Jeroboam is processing this on his own. He's, he's trying to process this whole situation, and he's just thinking, it says he thought to himself, right? He's not getting good counsel. He's not seeking out wise people to give him good advice. He's just doing it on his own. And he's like, oh, I got to do this, and I got I to gotta think of it this way. And when he finally does talk to somebody, we see in verse 28, he gets bad advice. And I think the lesson for us is that you need to be really careful who you're listening to. You need to be very careful who you allow to speak into your life. Now, I have to acknowledge that, that what he does, what Jeroboam does in the text, is politically brilliant. What he does in the text is shrewd. It is cunning. If he were alive in the 21st century in America, he'd be making big bucks as a political consultant. What he does, sharp. He, he gets his culture. But it's spiritually disastrous. And it all starts when he begins processing this without any help, and then when he does get help, it's bad help. And I guess what I'm telling you, church, is that the, 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 what, what the first step that leads to disaster is when you trust your own wisdom. I think Proverbs says not to do that. And, and then when you do get advice, and it's not good advice, it, it creates a disaster. And so when we look at this, we go, okay, I don't, I don't want to do that. <laughs> well, but that just leads to the next thing. That bad advice, it leads to compromise. And then we see the next step in the text. The next stage in the process is that compromise gets easier every time. In verse 28, this appeal that King Jeroboam makes to the people of the northern ten tribes, it's rooted in convenience. He tries to convince them that the journey to Jerusalem to worship the way God commanded is just too inconvenient for them. Now, strictly speaking, for those in the southern part of the northern kingdom, <laughs> that wasn't true at all. He sets up two of these shrines, one in Dan in the far north, right, and one in Bethel in the southern edge of the kingdom. Let me show you this on a map, right? So here's the, here's the map. There's Bethel, and there's Jerusalem. It's like 15 miles. He goes, it'll be convenient for you. It's not really that much further <laughs> to go to Jerusalem, so this king, the king's appeal to convenience, however, it would have been far more compelling for the people up north, near Dan. And, and, and it's not just because the trip would have been shorter. Dan is a really nice place to be. It's beautiful. Let me show you some pictures. So here's, uh, here's a picture of Mount Hermon. That's a map, but in a sec, there it is, Okay. So, I mean, here's, here's the view out to Mount Hermon. You can see it's the, the highest peak on the left. That's the one in the country of Jordan. And then the one in the middle there, that's in the country of Syria. And the little one to the right, that's in Israel. So they each kind of have their claim of Mount Hermon. The one that we would think of, though, was in, is in modern-day Jordan. Uh, and you're really, in this one shot, you're looking at three different countries. You're standing in Israel looking at, at you know, Jordan on the left and Syria on the right. Um, Excuse me, I got that backwards. Syria on the left, Jordan on the right in this picture, all right? And this is also the headwaters of the Jordan River. Let me show you another picture. So here's the Jordan kind of making a bend, and it's, it's all white. It's hard to tell, but those are rapids. It's gorgeous. You walk these trails, and it's green. And this is November, y'all. We were there in November, and it's green, and it's lush, and there's water rushing through the, over the rocks, and you, you're, you, no, nowhere in this whole site can you not hear water moving. It, it tinkles and trickles in the distance or it rushes and roars through the river. And so you've got the, the headwaters of the Jordan River. And then there's this, this site of the, the place, um, this whole thing. And you can see there the, the metal, the aluminum, I think it's aluminum, reproduction of, um, of the altar there. And you get a sense of the scale of this. It's huge. It was monumental construction. You see the people up there at the high place. I don't know if you noticed in the video, but Jim Crane walked by in the, in the background. Uh, so I, have to, I thanked him this week for being an extra in my video. Um, but it's just, it's this, you know, they're again, it's November and it's green and it's lush and it's beautiful. Who wouldn't want to go? <laughs> I mean, it's literally a national park. He appeals to convenience 
But he doesn't have the Ark of the Covenant, does he? No. He doesn't have the temple that Solomon built, does he? No. And so he has to build something else. Well, what's he going to do? Well, Israel had included a golden calf in their worship before. So he's like, well, we'll just bring that back. That's easy. And in doing that, he literally quotes Aaron word for word from, De- from Exodus 32 when Aaron says, as the people apostasy while Moses is on the mountain getting the Ten Commandments, these are your gods, O Egypt, who brought you up out of his, uh, or these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. And you have to wonder if the people around him in that moment were like, really? Like, I've heard that before. It did not turn out well for us. In fact, we know from uh, Second Chronicles that many of the Levitical priests left the northern kingdom and moved south because they were like, this is not right. This is not what God said. We shouldn't be doing this. Here's the thing. When you get bad advice and you compromise on your beliefs, you find it just gets easier every time. Every time you do that, it just gets easier. Every time you're willing to go, well, does it really matter? It just gets easier every single time. Which leads to the third step. Repeated compromise accelerates drift. You drift away further. You drift away faster with every single compromise. There are some scholars who say that Israel wasn't actually worshiping the calf as an idol. Rather, the calf was understood to be a visible throne for an invisible God. It sounds great. I appreciate them trying to give them the benefit of the doubt. But the text doesn't bear that out at all. (laughs) Because verse 30 says, this thing became a sin. In Hebrew, it literally reads, and it came to pass, or and it was a sin. It's unambiguous that this thing, it, it started off as something, we'll just make it easy, we'll just make it convenient, and before long, they're worshiping the calf as a god. In fact, the word that, that is used there for sin is the, the, one of the most common Hebrew words for sin, and it's where we get our, word idea, our idea of to miss the mark. There's a, a parallel term in Greek. It's, in, in Greek, it's the most common term for sin. It's to fail to meet the standard. <laughs> so we move on further in the story. We find out that Jeroboam specifically mandates these places of worship at particular times, and that is a clear violation of God's commands in Deuteronomy 12 and in Deuteronomy 16 to worship only at Jerusalem and at, at specific certain times of year. He says, no, you can worship in these alternative places, and I'm going to set up a festival, and it'll be one month later from the one that we're supposed to do. It was literally a month later, just to be different, I guess. And the point is this, repeated compromise accelerates the pace at which you move further and further away from the Lord. And all of you, when you read that right now, you probably have someone's life in your mind. You're probably thinking of somebody that you know, and maybe it's you. Now, I pray that God has redeemed your story, but you might be looking back at your own life going, oh, yeah, (laughs) been there, done that, got the T-shirt. That was an expensive T-shirt. I would not buy that again. See, if I could paraphrase a quote from a now- disgraced Christian leader compromising in your relationship with God will take you further than you wanted to go it will keep you longer than you wanted to stay and it will cost you more than you wanted to pay that's a disaster so how do we avoid that I don't don't want to live that way how do I avoid it Well, one of the things that makes this story so remarkable is the way the Holy Spirit-inspired author includes the way to avoid this disaster right in the passage there are three, three key components to this. Here's the first one. Number one, reject fear as a motivation. Reject fear as a motivation. What's motivating Jeroboam is fear. He's afraid that when the people go worship in Jerusalem as the law commands, that their hearts will turn back to the house of David, the, the southern kingdom, the Davidic line. 
And I want you to see this in verse 27. Jeroboam indicates, and this, this floored me when I realized this. I was, I was literally, I'm not making this up. I was literally crying in my office. He is more afraid that their hearts will turn to the southern kingdom than to the Lord. His fear was rooted entirely in the political aspects of this thing. And he didn't give a hoot about their souls. I mean, apart from just the clear out of wackitude of that, it shows just how far this man of standing had fallen and how fast it happened. Because it's compromise, 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 and before you know it, you are well and truly away from where God wants you to be. If you want to avoid spiritual disaster, you need to ruthlessly evaluate your own motivations and root out fear. Here's what I mean. How many small business owners have cheated in their business because they were afraid that there wouldn't be enough money? How many people have cheated on their spouse because they were afraid that they couldn't or wouldn't get something that they wanted out of that relationship? Y'all, so much of our compromises, so many of our compromises are rooted in fear. We're afraid of something. But our Bible says that perfect love casts out fear and that we're not to walk by fear, but to walk by faith. If you want to avoid disaster, you need to reject fear as a motivation. And every time you feel afraid about something, afraid to do the right thing, go, that, man, that is, that, that is the pathway to disaster because it's just one compromise after another. And before long, you're way off track. That's the first step. Here's the second step to prioritize God's word. Look at the end of verse 27. Right, this follows, uh, this this is what follows Jeroboam acknowledging his fear that the people will give their allegiance back to Rehoboam. He says, they will kill me and return to King Rehoboam. Now here's what's insane to me about that. In in the chapter prior, the prophet Ahijah had specifically promised that if he would follow God, God would give him a dynasty. Look at this. In 1 Kings 11, verse 37, this is the the prophet Ahijah speaking on behalf of God. So it's God's voice through the prophet Ahijah. However, as for you, I will take you and you will rule over all that your heart desires. You will be king over Israel if you do whatever I command you and walk in obedience to me and do what is right in my eyes by obeying my decrees and commands as David my servant did. I will be with you. I will build you a dynasty as enduring as the one I built for David and will give Israel to you. This blows me away. God flat out told him, if you'll just be faithful to me, I will build you a dynasty. And like, like literally a few verses later, he's like, they're going to kill me. No, dude. God is going to build, if God really does build you a dynasty, assassination is impossible. <laughs> you got to live long enough to see it. He didn't believe the word of the Lord. He didn't believe the prophet. He didn't, he he put his own fear above the word of God to him. And he literally got a word from God. How many times do we do that? Do you ever put your own fear over God's word? Do you ever put the things you're afraid of over what God says? If you want to avoid spiritual disaster in your life, you need to prioritize God's word. I I can't tell you how many times over the last 25 plus years in ministry, I've sat in my office and I've watched someone cry their eyes out over over the stuff they've done. And I I have to, I mean, in love, I bite my tongue because I'm like, you know that the Bible says not to do that, right? (sighs) You got to prioritize God's word. There's one more thing. You gotta choose your hard. I'm guessing most of you have heard that expression. Choose your hard. It basically means doing the right thing. It's often hard, 
But compromising and doing what is convenient or easy or fun in the moment often leads to a hard situation that's not fun at all to get out of. And the point is, if, if you're going to go through something hard regardless, you, you know, choose your heart. Do, do the right thing. And, and you, don't have to then, you don't have to experience all that pain. If Jeroboam would have had that little bit of wisdom and followed it, he would have realized that while it might seem hard and it might seem inconvenient and it might seem costly for the people to go worship in Jerusalem the way God commanded, he, he would have had a dynasty. As it was, he had a son who reigned for a few years and then was assassinated. Instead, he chose what was easy. He compromised. Scripture tells us three chapters later, his son and successor was killed. No dynasty. He compromised, he chose what was easy, and it led to a disaster. Do you want to avoid disaster in your life? Choose your hard. Working on your marriage is hard. It's better than divorce. Paying your taxes is hard. It's better than going to jail. Right? Talking to your grandkids or your kids about their worldview is hard, but it's better than watching them abandon their faith. Eating right and exercising is hard. It's better than laying in a hospital bed. You see what I'm saying? Maybe we should rephrase this. Because, because of the grace of Jesus, your story doesn't have to end like Jeroboam's story does. And, and that's the contrast I want to draw this morning because your compromises can be redeemed. They can be forgiven. So maybe we should call this, how do we avoid disaster or come back from one? <laughs> because the steps are the same. You want to come back from disaster? Disaster you got to decide not to be motivated by fear. you got to prioritize God's word in your life. And you're going to have to do things that are hard, but they're the right things. And you'll begin to find that by God's grace, he begins to undo your disaster. He redeems it. He takes what was broken, and he makes it whole. And he's able to do that because the only whole person who ever lived never compromised. And he died on the cross in your place for your sin. You see, not far from this place of compromise is a different place. Let me show you one more picture as we end this You Are Here series. This is the gate of Abraham. It's that middle bronze two gate that I showed you earlier on the map. This is a checkpoint, an ancient checkpoint. This is the northern entrance to the promised land. And what that means is that it's entirely probable. We don't know with 100% certainty, but it's very, very likely that Abraham and his family walk through that gate. It's been bricked up now to preserve it, to hold it together, because it's just mud brick. But you're looking at a place that Abraham himself probably walked right up those steps, right through that gate, and on into the promised land in following Jesus. <laughs> you know how Abraham's life was defined, right? Right? faith, not compromise. Think about what Abraham did. God told him, get up, pack your stuff, go to the land I'll show you. And without even knowing where he was going to go, he packed. Man, he didn't compromise. He laid aside his fear. He believed God's word and he did something hard 4,000 years ago. And then 2,000 years later, his descendant Jesus did the same thing for you when he died on the cross. And today, he's calling you 2,000 years after that to do this. You might never get to stand where he stood, but you can still live the life he lived. You can decide today to not live a life of compromises anymore. To, to reject fear, to prioritize God's word, and to step out in faith. And it might be hard, and you've got an opportunity to do it right now. Maybe you need to make a decision to follow Jesus, to give him your life, to be baptized. We're gonna sing. I'd invite you to come forward, and you can do that. Maybe you're here today, and you want someone to pray with you. We'd love to do that here down front, or you can go to the next step room. Maybe there's something where you've been dealing with a, a compromise in your life, and in, while we pray, you might need to step out in the hallway and make a phone call. <laughs> hey, um, I messed up. Can we fix this?
I don't know. I'm going to ask you to stand with me and, and encourage you to respond as God leads you today. Let's sing together.